everybody. Let's take a seat and welcome to our fourth lecture of the Tom Tooney series for 2019. This is the first one that we've had this year on real estate or and small space living, and it's kind of unique to our area. But since we all know that our resources in the community are being highly used, whether it's water or electric, I think it's time for many of us to think smaller. So our first speaker today is Roberta Sandenberg. She's an architect who was born in Brooklyn. She married a South African and spent most of her professional career in South Africa. After graduating from Vassar, she went on to earn her degree in architecture at Pratt University and then to the University of Johannesburg for a master's in urban design. But wherever she was, she always loved small space. She started out with a small apartment in Greenwich Village, and that became the foundation for her lifelong work of designing small space, which she is going to tell you all about, and she has a great slide presentation to tell you as well. Um, she, her last project that she worked on is actually a book, and there are some books in the back, <clears throat> and Roberta has a special price on them today of $10. Uh, if you buy them on Amazon, they're 20 so this is a great bargain, and she doesn't have many of them, and she'll be happy to sign them for you. And um, after Roberta finishes speaking, we'll have Jane Dillon come and talk about real estate, and I will tell you all about her later. And then after Jane and Roberta finish, there will be a Q&A followed by the house tour. And Sarah Davison is going to be telling you about that. And she's going to be interviewing Jane in her presentation. So help me welcome Roberta Sanders. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. That's like half my speech. <laughs> but thank you all for coming, and um, it's a surprisingly big turnout for people who I don't think live in small houses. <laughs> One does. I do. Two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I have my Manhattan audience. <laughs> well, you may not live in a small house, or you may not be planning to buy one, but everybody uh, should or could make better use of the space they live in. That applies to everyone. You can make your spaces work harder, you can make them work better, and it can change your life. Uh, for me, it's a bit different because I've had a passionate love affair with small spaces. And as uh, Sheila has said, um, it probably started with a uh, small apartment in Greenwich Village. We lived in the most beautiful little place. It's still there. It's an old building on 11th Street and 5th Avenue, just north of Washington Square. And when, I, when we found out that I was pregnant, no way were we going to move. So this was my very first experiment. We put the baby in a closet. <laughs> and it was great. Uh, of course, you have to take off the doors. And um, you have to be prepared that people will make jokes. But uh, it, was, it couldn't have been better. And um, I don't know if she'll be embarrassed, but um, my daughter's sitting right there. <laughs> None the worse for wear. <laughs> Spent three years. And what we discovered, um, that babies, of course, are very small. But what they have is a lot of junk, a lot of stuff. <laughs> and we um, found these drawers. Um, you can look at them. Uh, this is, uh, we're going to the next slide, but this, in my book, whenever I come to something, I have a bit of a how-to, so if you wanted to do the same thing, if you happen to have a very small apartment or house and we want to find a place for a baby, maybe your grandchild comes to visit you and you have absolutely no place for them, 
Uh, all it really means is measuring. I think every person who wants to live in a small space has to buy a very good measuring tape because <laughs> everything has to fit. You can't go in and find something that's approximately that size. It has to be exactly that size. So we found these cardboard drawers. They're stiff cardboard. They fold up and they can be painted or they come in different colors. And everything that she owned, I mean, every uh, di diapers and little uh, baby grows and blankets and sweaters, everything fit. We had nothing sticking out, nothing just lying around. You have to live that way uh, if you want to live small. Now, I um, have discovered one thing. Um, I've been not only living in small spaces for many, many decades by now, but designing them for clients. And when I first started designing things for clients that were small, I made one discovery, which I knew, but people were not prepared for. It's much harder. It's much harder to live in a small space. If you um, are moving into a normal size home, you just move your furniture in. You might have to change the curtains. But if you are moving into a small space, and if you're planning on downsizing, by the way, how many of you might be thinking of downsizing, so I know my audience? Yeah, well, that's everybody. I mean, eventually, I think we have to downsize or share our homes with people or uh, if you want to stay in place, then um, you have to start thinking a little bit differently about how you spread out. But my, um, my realization is that you have to make the body of your house, the fabric of your house, work tighter. And uh, it's what um, I actually call space opportunities. And I'll go through that a bit later on. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. So I, uh, space opportunities, just to give you a, a bit of a preview, I'm talking about the walls, the floor, the ceiling, the corners, every little, and I said the ceiling, and every bit of your house has to come into play if you want to make the very most of it. And that is what I've been doing, that's what my book is about, and that's what I want you to go away with, that you might be looking at your homes a little bit differently, using the space perhaps a little bit differently, and maybe finding yourself with space to spare, who knows? Maybe you don't have to live in a four-bedroom house anymore, whatever. Now, four years after my uh, little baby moved into her closet, we took a really interesting trip, and we bought a, a Volkswagen Combi and converted it in this way. Um, everything flopped out, slid out, very clever. The kitchen came out in the back, and it, the counter came down with a gas stove and with a uh, built-in little plastic bucket. And the uh, uh, bench inside became a slide-out bed. Now, <laughs> I just want to quickly let you know that those drawers, those yellow and orange drawers, are exactly the same drawers. Sorry, I forgot I had a pointer to use. They, these drawers are the same drawers as in the baby closet. <laughs> we packed them up, folded them up, and took them on our way. And the point of this, this is not perhaps for everybody, maybe somebody would like to try this, but for two, almost two years, three people, one a little bit smaller than the other, lived in under 80 square feet. Now, um, just to uh, go on with the um, saga of my uh, small space life, the next um, time 
uh, we made a small space for ourselves was in South Africa. And this is a garage, or garage, as Americans call it. It is the size of a two-car garage. And um, from the, I, I renovated it, and you can see from the uh, plan that it's very simple, an open, uh, we call it lounge, living room, dining, and then um, in, in back, a small bedroom, bathroom. Uh, the store was just uh, extra space, but most important, there was a spiral stair um, that led to um, a sleeping loft. So if you go back one slide, you see from the outside, it looks like a traditional African cottage. It's made of stone, has a thatch roof, but inside, um, people would be am amazed. Everything is doubled up. The, the bookcase becomes a glass holder. Um, this is a mini kitchen behind some uh, glass uh, doors. These are brass rubbings, by the way, that my husband and I made on our European trip in our 80 square foot home. And, and one thing I used was an apothecary chest, which is a, a little bit of a, a variation of my cardboard drawers. It's the same idea. Have little drawers, put everything away, and you just have to remember what's in each one. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to think about space opportunities with these various things. And people came to see my cottage. They were curious because nobody had ever seen anything like it in South Africa. In fact, I had to uh, order the kitchen from Germany because uh, there just was no such thing as a mini kitchen. Now, the very first space opportunity I've already spoken about, closets. Closets uh, don't have to be for babies. Um, uh, a closet can be a kitchen. Uh, here, here actually is my uh, present kitchen. A uh, small space book has followed me all over the world. Today, this is my uh, apartment in Manhattan. And when the doors are closed, you say, oh, well, that's an interesting door. And when the doors are open, the lights in the ceiling come on and you see that I have the world, I have the refrigerator here. I have no oven, I do have a, that problem, but I have a microwave and a kettle and places to put everything everywhere using the backs of doors, using shelves. So going on with the idea of closets, this is an idea that has now become um, very popular, it's in vogue, because with today's small space gadgets, you certainly don't need a whole room. In fact, if you do most of your work on your phone, you don't even need a closet. You just need a chair. <laughs> but again, the idea, if you do want to use a closet, use the backs of your doors, have everything organized on shelves, and away you go. And one of the nice things, um, I've done this closet idea for myself and for other people, offices. The nice thing is that when you close the doors, you're finished. And you're home. But you don't have to go home. You're already home. But you close the doors and you can just go on with your other life. Another idea is a bathroom. And, um, and uh, this is my Cape Town apartment today. A lot of these are my own spaces where um, we didn't have a shower. So I took a closet and took off the doors and installed um, a shower with a glass door, which makes it look much bigger than the space itself. So, clo so closets, I think I've done them now. Um, you can think of lots of things you can do with a closet, but you probably haven't thought of this. This is a Chinese design. This is a Chinese architect 
who decided that in one closet you can eat, you can work, and you can sleep. And he uses a pulley bed which drops down and he uses a table which slides out and another bed which slides out and it even can sleep two people. <laughs> so <laughs> whenever I talk about small spaces, I have to say we don't know anything about using space. You have to go to the Chinese or the Japanese and you can see some fantastic designs. But the other parts of your home can come into play. Walls, I mean, every home has walls. So you probably think, well, the walls are just enclosing the space or maybe dividing the space. But how about the old shaker idea of putting chairs on walls, keeping the floor clear? Or maybe a newer idea is to put a picture on the wall or a mirror and have it flop down and become a table. So this, uh, the shakers never thought of this, but I think it's just as clever, more clever. But a lot of things nowadays with laptops and iPads, you don't need a big desk. This is a perfectly good place to do your work. It takes up no space, it's on the wall, it flaps down. Now, uh, this is actually an idea. Remember I told you that we got rid of our only decent closet to put the baby? You can hang up clothes parallel to a wall. In other words, the way they do them in shops. You know, you just see the garments on the wall. And then put a curtain over it. These are extreme, but if you run out of closet space, it works. And then I'm going to come, to, uh, okay, another idea is not to put things on a wall, put things in a wall. This is a Danish architect who I think did a tremendous job of scooping out uh, a recess in a small room and it becomes a lovely bed and he was clever enough to even have a drawer that comes out and becomes a step. Now, a kid would love this, absolutely love it. And I haven't tried this myself. Um, I, in my book, I don't have only my own designs. I have incorporated designs from all over the world, but this is one of my own designs. Um, I'll go back, please. It, 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 um, from the outside, you'll just see drawers that are built into the wall. And it looks like it blends, but the way that it came about was having a closet with two racks of garments that met in the middle. Now that middle part is useless. It's like a dead space. So you might have this in one of your closets. A lot of people have this. It's just an idea. Take that dead space, make it useful, not useless, and install some drawers. I, I um, don't have any uh, patent on this idea, but it, it's just think, thinking that way is really what I'm talking about. Looking for a place that's dead, make it come alive. Floor spaces, um, this is something you've probably never thought of. It's under your feet. But you have the world of space underneath your feet, and it doesn't take a very high platform at all. Uh, if you wanted to provide storage, whether it's on a whole room or next to a bed, you only have to have a few inches high, and you have um, wonderful storage available. This is another floor idea, not particularly storage, but children's rooms are full of toys and usually there's just not enough space for them to play in. So if you put the drawers, the bed, in, as a drawer that comes out from a platform, they have double the amount of space to play in and then um, at night you just pull out, you take the toys and scoop them up put them on top of the platform, and they have a place to sleep. 
And I've also done this for older kids. Do they can do their homework, and then um, <coughs> they have their beds tucked underneath. There's a world of these ideas, not only mine, but plenty of other architects have worked on it. I'm just showing you um, a little bit of a smorgasbord ceilings. Now, many of you have thought of ceiling uh, bicycle hoists. In fact, if you go on Amazon, you'll find these hoists very cheap, very available, uh, two-day delivery, very easy to buy. Um, this is a, a very usual use of a hoist for a bicycle, but another one is the next slide, is for toys. <coughs> now, this is a simple idea that children can operate. You can just wind up the hoist, the um, pulley, wind up the pulley, wind up the pulley, and pick up your toy basket and then drop them down to the floor. And um, I saw this idea and I thought, wow, that is a great idea. And how about other things? How about tools? How about books? Um, we all have ceilings. Doesn't take much. I mean, you have to get a handyman or maybe have a handy husband. And you can just and, and here's my, my ultimate idea for ceilings. You have a dining room, you have a table on a hoist, you take your chairs, put them on the wall, and uh, voila, you have a room for a party, you can have a yoga class, you can hold a conference. <laughs> Think about it. It's just thinking about it. You probably never thought, oh my goodness, if only I didn't have that table in the middle of the room, I could really have a big space. <coughs> I call this empty spaces. And we all have them, but in a regular size house, you don't think about it. In a small house, you're trying to gain space. So underneath a kitchen cabinet, or in, underneath a bathroom cabinet, or underneath any cabinet, there's always a little bit of room for drawers. And I'm just suggesting, think about it. If necessary, use it. It's a waste of space, the way it is now. And here's a, a lovely idea of taking the space underneath a stairway. And everybody could use an extra toilet. Everybody could use a little guest toilet. And lots of people have stairways. Again, maybe look around your house, think about it. And here's a bit of a kooky idea, but I kind of love it, because nobody even thinks about it. But a bathtub takes a lot, a lot of space. It's a big fixture, and it doesn't provide any storage space. But if you build in a frame, um, if you build in a frame, you can certainly add storage space. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, a manufacturer comes out with a uh, commercial application. Because I've shown this idea to lots of people, and they all say, wow, that's, that's a good idea. Why, don't, why doesn't somebody sell that? Um, going down my, uh, what I call, space opportunities, I talk about corners. And corners are delicious. Everybody likes corners. If you go to a restaurant, where do you want to sit? People always pick the corner tables. They're cozy, they're uh, safe, they're secure, you like sitting there. But in your home, you have lots of corners. And sometimes you just need to use them. And here's a tiny corner, probably not taking up much space, but you can have a whole home office, a place to put your computer, and then even this, uh, this is a Japanese um, design shelf, which. I quite love, but you don't have to be as fancy as that, but just a small place for your computer, a shelf above, and you have a home office in just a tiny corner. And, uh, and then here comes a good place uh, for children. Um, take part of your room, a corner, paint it a different color, put down a comfortable, put down a thick rug, a couple of bean bags, uh, little shelves for their books or toys, and see if they'll stay there. <laughs> I, 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 they, they might just say, oh boy, this is my place, I, I can stay here, and they might not mess up your living room. 
So uh, it's an idea. Um, may not work for all children, but uh, just take it as a thought, an idea. Maybe look at your corners. Windows. Uh, everyone has windows. Nobody really thinks about using them. But again, small spaces you might want to. This is a commercial idea, and it's a good one. I'll go back, please. It's, um, this, these are louvers that when they're in the window, um, act as sun louvers. When you fold them down, back, um, they become a drying rack. And here's one that I did myself. Uh, this is a dressing table in a window. Uh, when you have, and it's great because you have natural light coming in, and you can buy a, um, a bottom-up shade so that um, uh, nobody can see you doing your makeup. But I can tell you this works well. I've used it. And um, here is um, something I have done. Um, this is in Cape Town, South Africa, where um, I put a bathtub into a bay window. Now, um, it's a very big bathtub, and I certainly didn't have enough space for it, but by building out, by building a bay window, I could have this big bathtub that we also use as a jacuzzi. Of course, now, with Cape Town's water shortage, we never use the jacuzzi. We can, we can only fill the bathtub up maybe one quarter of the way, and maybe just in terms of um, being a little bit um, kind to the planet, you shouldn't do that. But uh, in, in my day, everybody built jacuzzis. Not anymore. Um, a few other ideas before. Um, uh, I, I just want to talk about using a play loft above a desk. Um, uh, using a sleeping loft above closet. Using, um, this is really uh, a beautiful idea, not mine. Uh, this is a Swedish architect who thought of putting a bed above some kitchen cabinets. These are standard IKEA cabinets and taking the space that's usually used for a wall unit, this is probably where you would usually put it, he put a bed. And wow! Who would ever have thought of that? Um, very often you have to divide spaces. Um, you have two children, they both want a room. So this is what I call a zigzag partition. You give one child a bottom bed, you give the other child a top bed, and I've even put a little window so they could talk, if they're talking to each other, <laughs> they, could, so they could speak. And if you have a very small space, you may not want to have a divider that takes up space. So here's another idea. Put up poles or rods. You can see through them, but you know this is a separate area. This is your dining room. This is your living room. It's a little bit of what saying, yes, this is a different function. And I like this idea very much. And my last, uh, here comes the Chinese idea again. They know how to use space. This is a bed that you put a roller blind, which goes down, privacy, and then lo and behold, they move things around and it can become a dining table. <laughs> Without, you see, I mean, it's hard to see exactly how they do it, but it, uh, here's the benches, uh, part of the bed and it becomes a dining area, divided spaces. Okay, I, won't, uh, I don't want to uh, make your head buzz with all these ideas, but here's an idea that I think many of you would find useful. A converted space is making a home within a home, and you might call it an Airbnb opportunity. Here, um, uh, it's not only for, for income, but you could also um, have an elderly parent come live with you. You could have uh, a nurse, a 24-hour nurse. You could have a grown child who decides to come back and live with you. And you need a space, not only a room, you need a kitchen, you need a bathroom. So this is a, a design I did 
where you have a normal apartment, living room, bedroom, home. By taking one of the um, closets and making it into a bathroom, and making it, taking another uh, little space and making it into a kitchen, you have one, uh, one unit and another unit. And you can think of that for probably any spare bedroom that you have. You just need two closets. One becomes a bedroom, and one becomes a bathroom, one becomes a kitchen. Or you could take a master bedroom. Now here's a typical unit. Uh, here's a master bedroom and two, uh, two regular bedrooms. And you decide, oh, well, we don't really need a master bedroom anymore, but maybe we want a guest apartment, or maybe we want to rent it out. Take the master bedroom, take the dressing room, make it into a kitchen, and, and then what you also need is an outside entrance door uh, for guests, and you have a guest apartment. And um, here comes your um, child, wants to come back and live with you. He can have, or she or she can have a separate space. And my last idea, my sort of a home within a home converted idea is really a hallway. And you would never have thought of this, but this is a, a French architectural firm. They took a, a long, narrow space and built everything that it, it slides in and out. So if you go back, uh, okay, here, the uh, closet slide in and out, table and chairs slide in and out, <coughs> shelves slide in and out, and then there's a sleeping loft on top. And lo and behold, there's a bookcase that slides in and out, and it becomes steps. Um, I haven't mentioned the word clutter. <laughs> and of course, to do any of this, you have to be ruthless. You have to become ruthless about clutter. And it's, um, I mean, lots of people have made careers about this nowadays, and Marie Kondo um, has made a religion of tidying up, and there's organizers um, everywhere. But the idea is, examine everything that you have. Take a look. Do you need it? Do you love it? If you don't, if you want to live smaller, if you want to downsize, if you want to be a little kinder to the, uh, to the uh, planet, you have to start getting rid of stuff. And what I say is um, lose the junk and gain the space. So I'm just going to uh, uh, say this about being kinder to the planet. Uh, the idea of small spaces has now become very popular. And um, I'm very pleased because, you know, now people are interested in what I have to say and have had the opportunity to uh, write this book. But I don't think it's only about the high price of real estate. I think it's that people are very aware of how much damage we are doing to the planet. And one of the easiest things to do is to reduce our footprint, live uh, a little bit smaller. Unfortunately, when I studied architecture, which uh, was many decades ago, not only did nobody ever discuss this, nobody ever thought about it. We were just um, uh, drawing pretty pictures, making them, uh, suit our clients' needs, no thought, not one, about the word green or about uh, are we being kind, are we going to have a planet left once we finish all our fancy buildings. So I um, think I have talked enough. <laughs> um, I hope you've got a few ideas that you might even use even for your big houses. You might think about maybe you want to start downsizing. If you have extra space, you might even make it into a guest apartment. So um, thank you all for coming.
now going to move on. We're now going to move on with Jane Dillon. Uh, Jane graduated from Queens College and moved to East Hampton, where she has lived since 1987. She has 30 years of experience as a real estate broker, mostly with Sotheby's International Real Estate, and now Saunders and Associates as a licensed broker. She's owned several homes here and has gone through the rigors of renovation. Almost a year ago, she purchased a wonderful home that all of us have seen, we all love, at the corner of um, uh, Cheryl Road and Newtown Lane. And so that's going to be part of our tour today. So help me welcome Jane Dillon and Sarah Davison, who is going to be conducting the interview. Wow, that, that was really stimulating, Roberta, and it's uh, brought all those great ideas back here to the Hamptons, and uh, we're going to bring it right home and uh, talk to a brilliant realtor in East Hampton, Jane, about her professional experience in the real estate business vis-a-vis -vis small spaces and her own personal experience in her charming bungalow, which you're all going to get to see on the tour. So just a few words about the tour. We have three houses. They're all within the village. You must drive uh, to each one. And the map and the information about the houses is on a handout that will be on the back tables as you leave. So you must present the handout when you get to the house. Uh, that will allow you in to see the house. Uh, for Jane's house, I recommend you park either at the railroad station or in a little lot by Osborne Lane. Um, the, another house is right on Newtown Lane, there's lots of parking there, and the other house is on Buell Lane, I mean Dayton Lane, excuse me, and there's parking on the street. When you park on the street, please park in the direction of traffic and do not block driveways. So Jane, is there a market for small houses in the Hamptons, land of the mansion? Um, there really isn't, and not in my, my experience. People don't... You know, they, they think 2,000 square feet is a small house out here. You know, I, now, after uh, your, your, your wonderful talk, I, my house is about 940 square feet. I feel like it's huge, you know? Uh, the, people talk about downsizing, but I don't think they're realistic about it out here. That's been my experience. What about these small, modern houses I'm seeing cropping up in Springs and Montauk, where sort of hipster surfers are living? Oh, you mean like ditch planes and yeah. you know, the, the trailers that they're renovating? A lot of these are being bought by people as not even a second, maybe even a third home, so they can take a shower near the beach. I mean, it's just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. so even, um, you know, the cottages by Seasprite, some of those are rented by people who have houses inland, so, so they can have a little place just by the, uh, by the ocean. Right on the ocean. Yeah, right on the ocean. <coughs> So, so you really believe that the market in the Hamptons, or East Hampton in particular, is not a small house market yet? Not yet, no, not yet. People are downsizing. There's, people are selling their big houses south of the highway that need a lot of work, and maybe moving to the watch case factory in Sick Harbor. But again, those are you know, 1,700 square feet, 2,000 square feet, and then the maintenance is kind of high there mm -hmm. also. <coughs> Okay, so let's let's transition to your own wonderful bungalow. Uh, to, when did you purchase the house? I bought it actually just after Labor Day last year. Yeah, I was I sold a bigger house in Amagansett that had a pool and just the maintenance was just driving me crazy. <coughs> yeah, it's just me and a dog, so you know that's enough space. Okay, so you have a dog. So just like a, a baby with their toys, and dogs and beds and okay. chewies and bowl, bowls. Um, did you have to do anything particular to accommodate your dog in your bungalow? Well, he has his own little bedroom. Yeah, he's got his, he's got his crate and, and bedroom. And their their beds all over the house that I keep tripping over. Yeah. And uh, so it was the, the the maintenance, the hassle, and the cost of the maintenance that really drove you to downsize. Uh, a little bit of that, and also not wanting a pool anymore. Mm. I'm tired of having a pool, the maintenance of the pool. I mean, yes, it did make me able to rent the house out when I wanted to, 
But then it's like, I didn't need all that space. I didn't need all those closets. I didn't, and the more closets you have, the more clothes you have, the more, if you have an attic, you store stuff in the attic. If you have a basement, you store stuff in the basement. It kind of gets out of hand. Yeah. <laughs> so when you approached the renovation, uh, did you have any particular challenges or problems during the process? Or, and you were thinking of, this is my new streamlined life. How do I want to make it perfect? Um, well, I guess part of the problem was giving, I had a lot of furniture that I just had to give away. And I, I went up giving it away to the carpenters who were, <laughs> who were doing the house. When, they, when the movers came and brought everything into the house, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, little by little you just say, what's important? What do I really need? You know. Now I assume you don't shop at Costco. Oh, sure I do. Oh, you do? Yeah. How do you deal with those crates? Of well, I have a basement. Uh -huh. I do have a full basement, yeah, which is part of the problem. I have two rolling racks down there that I have to go through and cut a pair down, pair down. Yeah. So, so you don't have any secret storage tips because you've got a basement? Well, you, I am very organized, which is good. You know, it, the, the good thing about, you know, I do read, I, I, I love the Marie Kondo and stuff. I do roll up my clothes. Uh, yeah, no, I do. It's, it's, it's kind of fun in a way. Are your rolled up clothes going to be on display when we go see your house? If people want to. You are so kind. All right, now let's talk about what this has done for you socially. Well, so you've so moved from Anagansett to you couldn't be more central in the village of East Hampton. What's happened to your social life? Uh, well, the good thing, the good thing about it is, it's I kind of don't ever feel alone. There's always people walking by. I go out in the morning to pick up my newspaper. I see somebody I know. You know, in, I'm in my pajamas, and it's like, "Hi, Jane. How are you this morning?" Um, and it's kind of fun. Some days my car never leaves the driveway, and I'm not in the house. I'm out. I'm Working, I'm, I belong to the LBIS. I walk over there. I, I can walk. I, you know, I don't need to, you know, have the car all the time, which is great. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you've noticed a, a, a real decrease in your use of the car, which sure. is, of course, getting back to Roberta's comment about it's good for the planet. That you're walking it's better for your health. You're walking more. You're using the car less. How did your dog adjust to being downtown? <laughs> Well, it took a little bit because every time the train goes by, he stands at the front door and he's like, and now he's used to it. Okay, but in the beginning, it was it took a little bit. Yeah, he was, and when people walk by, they're so close to the house. Again, you know, he he, he took a little bit of uh, them coming by, and then he he realized, oh, okay, they're not coming in my house. That's okay. Great, great. Okay, so um, now tell us all again. What, about what your, your house is so distinctive, and all, you'll all get to see it and appreciate what I'm saying, but uh, what year was it built approximately? They tell me it was built in the 1930s, and it was built by a developer who um, was using this house and the house next door as model homes for homes that he would build for, like vacation homes in Miami. Mm -hmm. And my house was a kind of a mint green, and the house next door, which was a little bit bigger, was a kind of a salmon pink. Um, and they were just so unique. I mean, just really so different and so unique. Unfortunately, the one next door, they tore it down in, I guess it was two, 2011, and they sold it for, it was just a land value at that point, and they built a monster house right next door. Um, and it's a tiny, it, that's actually a smaller piece of property than my house. I at least have a backyard. He, they don't even have a yard. So by now you're all probably figuring out where Jane lives, right? <laughs> well, it was a well-built house. It, it stood the test of time. It has solid walls. You're right next to the railroad track. You've gotten habituated to that. People walk by. I mean, you feel um, like when you're inside eating your breakfast that you can close out the rest of the world. Oh, sure. Sure, especially. Well, the biggest thing I had to do when I first moved in, there was just a grate in the hallway that was the uh, the heating system. It, it was just a grate, um, which was really, you know, not not too cool. So we had to change the heating system immediately. So I have, you know, central heat. I have air conditioning. So it, it's just fine. Yeah. 
Well, congratulations, Jane. You've really done a, a wonderful job, and everyone's going to enjoy seeing your house. Now we're going to turn it over to you, the audience, to ask these two uh, speakers any question you like, and Sheila is going to moderate the Q and A. Thank you, um, and thank you, ladies, for your insight. It's been very interesting. I have a question, particularly for Jane, as it relates to trends in real estate. Are you seeing clients from Manhattan or anyone else coming to East Hampton who are looking for uh, more compact type spaces, or what are you seeing out there in the marketplace as it relates to real estate? No, well, it's pretty quiet actually. The market's really it's down. It's been digging. It's down like twenty three percent since last year. And when people come out and they're looking for smaller spaces, they're not usually realistic. Um, they think they can get something under a million dollars and it's just kind of not the case out here. So I, it's, not, it's not a trend. I don't see that as being a trend at all. What, what do you see as being kind of like the top wants or needs of among your clients? They want bigger houses. They want, um, they want to impress their friends. Okay. A lot of them live in small apartments in New York, so they want space out here. That's that's what we're seeing. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask Jay, yeah. what kind of dog she Yes, has? and will we get to meet him? <laughs> um, well, he'll be in the car um, in the driveway with the windows open, and he's an orf. He's an orf dog. He's a rescue dog. He's, right. We call I call him my little orphan. <laughs> Um, it seems to me like you can apply all your principles to um, what they call the tiny house that they that they take on a car, you know, that on a they take it around. Yes, for sure. Uh, I'm just involved right now in making what I call micro uh, designing what I call micro houses. Um, yes. Um, of course, um, architects are now looking at zoning uh, for these tiny houses. Um, they, uh, some municipalities have caught up and are providing um, places with you know, small lots or divided lots where you can put them. But uh, yes, my ideas fit right in with the tiny house movement. Um, I, um, I find a lot of the tiny houses are not fitted, you know, so in other words, you have to start doing a lot of the tricks and techniques that, or some of them that I've spoken about to make them livable, uh, unless you just want to live without any convenience. Uh, but your question is right, uh, this tiny house movement, which is uh, a new kind of RV, let's say, um, is on the right, on the same track. You, would you say something about lighting in small houses, how you can make the most use of natural light? Okay, um, uh, natural light uh, is, uh, of course, uh, open to the idea of skylights, uh, if you're uh, lucky enough to uh, not be in a multi-story building. Bay windows, I believe, are a blessing. Even the smallest um, apartment comes alive with a bay window, and you can use them for um, seating, for desks, for even bathtubs. And of course, um, uh, interior lighting. Uh, Artificial lighting can help enormously. Um, I do have a, a, a chapter on lighting um, in my book, but um, sometimes you can fool the eye. Uh, that's what I will say about a small space in lighting. Uh, you might not notice that it's a pokey little bit, uh, studio apartment if you have a very fancy and even a designer pattern of lighting on the ceiling. So um, that might not be something you've thought about, but um, look up, look at the ceiling and think of ways to make your lighting interesting. And um, it opens up, you know, your eye will look up and they'll be very, they'll be amazed. 
to see that maybe it's only a one room apartment. I had a friend uh, and she didn't have a window in her bathroom. And so she bought a large stained glass window and put light behind, lighting behind it. What a good idea. And it was really nice. Anybody else? Yeah. Just listening to your presentation about small spaces, I wonder if there's been any thought to applying this to the homeless crisis in New York City. Because they've just been saying that the hardest people to place are single adults, many of whom actually work but have to live in shelters because there's no housing for them. And it just struck me as having taking a small room and perhaps applying some of these techniques could really help this problem. I was wondering if you've heard anything about that. Well, um, I went to a conference last year uh, by, by one of the uh, architects working on this problem. You know, the, the city has built specific, uh, specific buildings that are sometimes half homeless and half uh, low income. And they are small rooms. They, they are small. I don't think, um, uh, I mean, anybody can fix up their place and make it more livable, but it does require some means, and it needs some motivation. So I think, so yes, I, I would love to give a talk to homeless people who are living in these uh, new buildings, but um, they might ask me, well, where are we going to get the money to do this? And, um, who are we going to get to do it? Um, you know, they have a hard enough time um, just existing. But yes, uh, wow. Well, uh, I think everybody should make their place where they live a place where they have joy, where they're happy. And of course, on the street, oh my God. I, I really love some of your designs, uh, but it seemed like in order to make them work, you would have to have some very good expert carpenters and people with uh, exceptional skills to build these special cabinets. And <clears throat> I'm just wondering uh, how expensive these renovations became and that that cost factor was something that was a negative. Yes. Um, I, I've been lucky. Um, uh, <laughs> First, I had a very handy husband, and then in, in South Africa, the cost of labor is low. But even in my um, present life uh, in very expensive Manhattan, you always find handymen. And um, you, know, you don't need a carpenter. I discovered that um, getting a handyman to give you a price is the way I go. And my, you see, my uh, philosophy is space is money. Uh, especially, of course, if you're talking about Manhattan real estate or East Hampton real estate too. Personally, I don't mind spending a bit extra and recommending that my clients spend the money because at the end, the place where you live works like a much bigger apartment or a much bigger house, and that would have cost you double, triple. So yes, um, you have to find a person, and if it's not you, if it's not your wife or husband, you have to look around. But there's plenty of handy people around who would like a job. I, I have a question. Um, your apartment, you show the two double doors and you have a kitchen behind it, and you said you don't have a stove, you have a microwave. Mm -hmm. So my question is, if you were creating a tiny kitchen for a rental, would you choose to go with a stove and a small microwave or a cooktop and a larger convection oven? Um, okay, uh, just to tell you, there are now um, my, you know, these mini kitchens available, you know, order them online, they have ovens, they have even dishwashers. I mean, they, they have become so clever uh, that um, 
you can actually, you don't have to say either or. You can now find them with two cooktops, an oven, microwave, and even a little slide out drawer dishwasher. So if I was in the market today, I would order one of those. One more question. The cardboard boxes that you used, are they readily available? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I went online recently to see if they have them. They, you can look under archive, um, archive uh, cardboard boxes, and they don't, they're not as nice as the ones I bought uh, decades ago. And I was thinking I, I would um, order them and then paint them myself, but yes, you're right, they're, they're not as nice anymore. They used to be very available. We have one more. Uh, about, I think about 15 years ago, I remember reading about an architect, I think her name was Susan Saranka, and she uh, is an architect from Minnesota, she's written a number of books, and she was sort of giving an alternative to the McMansion type of phenomenon that we were seeing these huge houses. Uh, and I, after reading it, it seemed like this, this whole idea of a smaller house is, is almost like a philosophical statement. And, and there's another movement called the minimalist movement that you know, supports this idea of living with less and making it more mean, meaningful. I wonder if you could just uh, say something about that. Yes, um, I suppose I am guilty. Uh, I am a bit of an evangelist uh, for living minimally, for living small. But um, I, I also like it um, perhaps psychologically. Um, you feel um, it's cozy. I'm just going to give a few adjectives. It's safe. You feel that everything fits perfectly. No wasted space. And it's, it's um, especially if you're living alone, um, you don't want to have long corridors. Okay, but you're talking about whether we're part of a cult movement or a, um, a movement. Yes, there is a small space movement now, and people get... Um, very excited about it. I would just say it's a practical thing to think about, but um, you don't have to tell everybody they have to downsize, you have to downsize. You know, some people like to live in bigger places. Um, have I answered your question? You, know, you don't have to wave a flag. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Roberta, and thank you, Jane. This is really great. Very informative.